All right, hi everybody. Um, I mean, I was just introduced, so uh, I, I am actually a software developer at a company called GLG. Probably no one in this room has heard of it. Um, on top of that, I am the author and maintainer of a games library called Pursued Pi Bear, which currently is built on top of Pi Game. Um, and I'm basically a lifelong games enthusiast. Um, when I say I'm a lifelong games enthusiast, I, I mean like I've really been there. I have played anything you can think of, tabletop RPGs, trading card games. Uh, I've LARPed. <laughs> um, if anyone knows what that is, you can call me out later. Um, and really, that doesn't stop at playing games. Um, when I was younger, uh, my brother and I used to try to make card games together because magic was really the thing that got us going. Um, I actually turned in a couple of board games as school assignments for like book reports and things. Um, and when I started programming, it's games that got me going. Um, I can confidently say that video games are why I'm a developer today. I jumped in heat. <laughs> um, I jumped in feet first and used games as a platform to learn. Um, in school, I was a business major, so most of my advanced math is actually statistics. Um, using games, I actually learned some other advanced math, calculus, trigonometry, uh, linear algebra. I actually wrote my own vector class. OK, how are we losing this? There we go. Um, I taught myself some physics. Uh, if you start making physics-based games, you kind of need to know them. Um, and I even spent a couple of weeks studying the ins and outs of uh, fireworks. I was building a little fireworks simulator, and I kind of had to know how those all work. So it, it, it gives you a reason to research all sorts of things. Um, but on top of all of that, games taught me software development principles. Um, so I've actually organized this talk a little bit like a game, uh, the way I would write a video game. Uh, seriously? <laughs> uh, so before we start, I'm going to talk about a couple of things you need to know about how GUIs work and things like that. Uh, just basic concepts so you understand what we're talking about when we go into the next section. After that, we actually will s simulate our own game loop here. Uh, so we'll talk about what you need in a game loop. Uh, player input, modeling, sim modeling and simulation, your rendering. Um, and then we're, when we're done with all of that part and the actual like, nitty gritty of like, how you write games, uh, we're going to actually talk about organizing your code um, just a little bit. Uh, and then I've got a couple of additional resources to go check out. Um, and I will talk about all of those. So. Games are a graphical interface. Every single graphical interface you've ever used is a what we call a long-running process. Um, all right, uh, it's a long-running process. Basically, it just means it keeps running, waits for a little bit of input. Um, when it gets input, it does whatever updates it needs to do, and then it returns a response. Um, and that response can either be drawing something to the screen. Uh, if you're talking about a web server, it can send uh, data over the wire back to the person who requested it, things like that. Um, so because that's the case, uh, we tend to have our loops look like this. Uh, so this is like the most basic game loop you'll ever, ever write. Um, while true, handle input, simulate, render. Um, actually, if you wanted to, you could actually define each of those functions and write tic-tac-toe using just these three functions. Um, it's a little weird, but you can do it. Um, this is actually great for your first game, um, but I don't actually like the pattern of while true. Um, so the first thing I would tend to convince people to do is uh, running equals true. Um, very simple, not much to do. Um, and so basics of how loops work. Um, moving from there, we're going to actually talk about handling input. Um, so when we're talking input for video games, it's often hardware. Um, OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, when we're talking hardware, uh, what we're actually talking about is hardware interrupts. Uh, so your keyboard, your mouse, uh, 
There's some details I'm going to leave out here because I actually spent too many hours uh, researching this the other night. Uh, <laughs> but basically, every time you press a key, move the mouse, press a button on the mouse, uh, an interrupt gets sent to your processor. Uh, all of your games libraries let you access the list of those interrupts at some point. Uh, one of the ways that happens, which is the way that Pygame does it, um, is what's called polling. So during your event loop, you would have to do something like this. You would get your events out of your event system and respond to each one. Um, this is actually how Pygame works. Uh, so if you've ever used Pygames, this is what the events module it does. Um, but this isn't the only way to do it. The other way you can do it is actually use callbacks. Um, if anyone in here has ever done JavaScript, uh, that's what the on handlers all do. Um, so you can write it like JavaScript, where like you give uh, you name your functions a special way, uh, kind of like this. Or the one under that is uh, a publisher subscriber pattern. Uh, you listen to the publisher for a specific event and give it a callback function to call when that happens. Um, this model, both of these are available in various game libraries in Python. Uh, so all three of these you will we'll see somewhere. So the other thing I want to talk about, though, is that putting these all through your code, um, especially for like keyboard input, if you're talking like player movement, um, if the player presses A, you want to move left. Um, because players are picky, <laughs> um, and it's a little nicer for your code, uh, you probably want to actually abstract this part. Um, I, I refer to it as a controller object. Uh, you define buttons or axes. Uh, so like left and right is the so standard WASD movement. Uh, a goes left, D goes right. What you would do is you would make that a single axis of input, um, and your controller would figure out what the value of that axis will be in each game loop. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a slide of that because it's slightly complicated. Um, if you want to find me later, I can probably show you the basics. Um, but that actually will let you to, uh, configure those axes and buttons uh, via like a configuration file. So players can choose what two buttons go left and right or up and down. Uh, so we're going to talk about modeling. Uh, most books you find or tutorials for video games, they're going to have you do something like this. Uh, basically just using data structures of some sort, tuples, uh, dictionaries, lists. You name it, you can find somebody using that system. Um, this is OK. Uh, you can actually make functional games this way. Um, the problem is these get really messy. <laughs> um, I, I have a 600 line code uh, video game sitting in one of my repositories that was my first game, written exactly like this. Um, I don't like going back to that code. It, it's really hard to process. <laughs> um, so moving from that, I tried to move into object oriented oriented game development. Um, so you make a class, and you give it uh, various uh, methods for, what you, for its behaviors. Um, you keep all of your attributes in one place. Uh, this actually lets you minimize your simulation space, so you only have to think about one or two objects at a time. Because if it's a collision, you really only need to know this object and that object to make them figure out what to do. Um, so that's a really cool. Uh, step forward from just data, uh, data bags. And then the last system I want to talk about is called Entity Component System, um, which looks kind of like this. Uh, the breakdown, basic idea of ECS is your game objects are your entities. And they're literally just containers. Um, in this case, I have a class with uh, what it would clearly be a list. Um, but you can model that however you want. But the entity doesn't have any of its own attributes. The attributes actually go onto the components, which are contained by the entities. Um, that's where you'll put things like, if you need um, your game objects to live, for example, you would put the alive attribute on a component um, and then put that into your entity to give it that ability. Um, and then systems are actually where you define your behaviors. 
a system on every tick is handed each object and operates on it if it has the right components. Um, I don't have a good example for that one right now, um, but here's what that code, like this is clearly just sample code, um, but this is kind of like what it would look like. So when we're talking about behaviors, oh, I skipped some bit. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about behaviors, um, when I say behaviors, I mean anything a thing can do. Um, so talking about Gauntlet, that, that's what this game is from, uh, or this screenshot's from, uh, there's a bunch of different behaviors being demonstrated on this screenshot. Uh, the player and the three little ghosts can move. Um, all three, all of those things, the, the little spawner, which is the bone pile, the ghosts and the player can be hurt. Um, the player can attack. Uh, and the spawner can spawn. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that's, when I say a behavior, that's what I'm talking about. So the way you program your behaviors can obviously take a lot of forms. You can use systems like in ECS. Um, but depending on how you model your game, that's kind of going to force your hand on how you write your behavior systems. Um, in that functional program, usually your behaviors have to be a function that takes an object, um, similar to the systems, but uh, you have to change the state in the object. Some people don't like that. So um, then when it comes to like object-oriented, your behaviors can actually just be methods on each class. Uh, so one of the other things is it's really hard to use like the state or strategy patterns if you're using the, the functional model. Um, that is definitely an object-oriented pattern. Uh, for those who don't know what the state or strategy model is, is you have a second object that your object is using, and you defer to that for your behavior. Um, I don't really have a code sample. I will, again, come find me. Uh, so one of the uh, first warnings I want to give when you're building your behaviors, uh, some of your first games, uh, people tend to do games that do uh, per tick updates. Uh, so a tick is one time through our game loop. Um, when we have a one tick, when we do this, uh, it looks kind of like this. Uh, so this is every time we update, move the position one pixel up. This is fine for your first couple of games, uh, but you'll quickly run into a bunch of limitations. One of the big ones for me is um, you can't get slower than one pixel. <laughs> uh, so what you, what you should do is all of your behavior should be based on time, um, which looks, this is the comparison shot. Uh, so what we do down here, you see uh, DT, which means delta time. Um, Delta time is the difference between the last tick and this tick. Um, mostly it's the, how much you should simulate this next step. Um, and then what we do is we take that movement and multiply it by the delta time. So if it's one millisecond delta time, instead of one, we would go 0.001, if that makes sense. Um, and that's the difference there. Then once you've figured out delta time, uh, the next step, uh, if you're using your game loop to determine your delta time, uh, you can actually get caught with like uh, any time that the processor pauses your uh, process to do something else, uh, that time is going to get included in your delta time, uh, which actually gives you some variability based on how fast your processor is, how tight your game loop is. Um, it makes it very hard to predict how big delta time is. Uh, so the trick actually would be every time you get a new delta time, you break it up into little chunks. So if I have 33 milliseconds and I want to run my simulation at 16 milliseconds per frame, I just cut that into two and I save that extra one to take into the next uh, loop. Uh, that gets you, I don't have a good example of that, um, but can give you um, a lot more control over what your simulation looks like. Um, it's easier to debug things when you don't have to worry about it taking 10 milliseconds versus 50. <laughs> uh, another pattern which you kind of see in work you, that this example shows you uh, is what's called the update pattern. 
what it is is your outside loop is going to call an update function every frame, um, which you see here as our on update. Um, and it gives you a really clean place to start hooking in all your behaviors at. Uh, so the other thing we're going to talk about in modeling and simulation is actually collision detection. I'm going to explain two quick algorithms uh, that are really, really simple. Um, and we'll get you through your first you know, dozen games or so. Uh, the first one is actually going to be circle collision. So this is, the, uh, this is actually a function that will do it. Um, but what circle collision is, to, to see if two circles intersect, um, you basically have to check the distance between their center points um, and see if it is shorter than the combined radius. Um, I would have gotten a really nice circle diagram to show this, but it didn't really have time for that. Um, but really, the only two pieces of information, as you can see, are the radius of each object um, and the center point of each object. Uh, so, so you basically got one measurement, one piece of addition, and one comparison, and you know if something's collided. That said, as fast and easy as it is, it's got a little bit of a problem. Um, a circle almost definitely has more space uh, than your game object. It'll almost always have a bunch of empty space in it. Um, one of the ways to fix that is a slightly more accurate one, um, and it's called axis. It's box collision. Uh, so using axis aligned bounding boxes or AABBs. Uh, what you do to explain this, this one's a mouthful. Um, what you have to do is take the highest point of either box, the lowest point of either box, take that distance and compare it to the height of the bo both boxes combined, and then do the same thing with the left and the right. Um, as I said, complicated to explain. Um, but the code itself is actually not that bad. Uh, you combine the heights, uh, take the distance between the highest top and the lowest low, combine the widths, get the furthest left and the furthest right, um, and then as long as both of those comparisons are true, then they're colliding. So this is going to be a little more accurate because boxes tend to be closer to the shape of what you're working with. Um, from there, you would have to go to like polygon collision, um, which I am not explaining. <laughs> All right, rendering. Oh, rendering. <laughs> uh, so, if you've never played with uh, rendering anything before, your screen is made up of pixels. I'm sure everyone knows that. Um, there, each pixel has three values that it can display, uh, various brightnesses. Uh, this is simplifying for things like pixel density and a couple of other things because, quite frankly, it gets confusing. <laughs> One of the notes that is in here, though, that I need to cover is uh, the origin. When you're doing math on your pixel array, the origin is actually the top left corner, unlike you know the Cartesian coordinates you learned in school. Um, so that means that positive x, positive y is going down. Uh, this this catches some people off guard. Um, the good news is that while all of this is true, um, and this is how the physical stuff works the actual code doesn't look that different. Um, in general, your game library is going to give you a window or a display object, uh, which is basically an array of pixel data in memory. Um, and it puts that on screen for you. You don't have to think about the actual process, thank goodness. Um, Um, so in 2D games, basically both of these objects are just going to be pixel arrays, um, usually with slightly nicer interfaces. Um, clearly, this is this is the part of the game stuff that I try not to think about very much because it's just it's it's. I don't enjoy graphics programming. Um, basically, that 
whatever this window or display object is, that's going to represent your full screen. Um, Now, the ability to use this just like a pixel grid, though, um, actually creates one bad habit that I've only recently been able to break. Um, basically, a lot of tutorials are going to teach you to use that pixel array as your sim simulation space. So wherever in the screen a thing is, that's where you should draw it. Uh, this is fine for things like uh, simple arcade games where the limit of the game is the screen itself. Um, but as soon as you do anything more complex or you want to start adding um, quirks to the camera, um, this actually blocks you completely uh, because you only have one space to draw things. Um, in general, you should add a second object that is represents your camera. Um, this can move like any other game object, uh, and you can give it things like zoom. Uh, and you use those to determine where to draw things to the screen. Um, Fixing this, uh, so with the camera, and then in the game space, you can just think in things like meters or centimeters or whatever arbitrary unit you want. And then the location of the camera to the object translates into the actual pixel space. Uh, in general, your game library gives you two basic sets of features for putting things on screen. You're going to have a drawing library, which is a set of primitives, um, basically parameterized primitives. So like a rectangle will ask you for the four points of the rectangle and what color you want it to be and whether you want it filled. Um, circle will be center point and radius, things like that. Um, and the other one is blitting, which is taking an image in memory and just putting it on the other object. Um, in general, your blitting process is you take wherever you want to draw something to, um, pass it the thing you want drawn, um, and just tell it where. One more warning about rendering, though. Uh, in my experience, rendering is the most expensive thing you're going to do in Python. Um, some of my early games in Pygame uh, could take over 33 milliseconds to render the frame, and that was all it did, leaving you with basically negative time to do all of your actual game processing to keep you under 30 frames a second. Little warning. Uh, next thing to talk about. We're going to talk about scenes and scene management. Uh, basically, what a scene is is one of the parts of your game. So if you have multiple levels, or you have menus, or you have a game over screen, uh, each one of those is going to be its own scene. Uh, In general, um, I like to think of scenes as a container. It's where all your game objects live and can do their thing. Um, now, how you program them, on the, on the other hand, is a little different. Uh, the very first scenes I did in my video games were actually just loops. Uh, so I needed to go to the menu loop. And that would have manage its own objects, draw itself stuff to the screen, basically the whole process over and over again. Um, after that, I decided to start using um, classes to do it. That way, the render loop, just I could write once and subclass. Uh, but the rest of the game, uh, basically, I still had multiple loops, and I had loops running inside of loops. Uh, so if you ever got to the point of debugging something, you're looking at a stack trace that's you know that long. <laughs> and then in the library I'm writing, um, there's actually an engine that does it for you. So the scene itself doesn't have a loop at all. You set it up, and you tell it what all of its objects are, and then those get called by the engine itself. Um, neat part of that is that you can actually test the scenes on their own. So you instantiate a scene. You call specific functions. You can look at what it looks like on the other side. Um, testing is always great. Um, you will want to experiment with all of these different methods. Um, Mostly because what you're going to use is going to depend both on your skill level and what you need from the game. Um, you know, if you've only got two loops, maybe it's okay to just do two, a loop inside a loop. All right, so let's cover libraries. Let's cover other resources. Uh, so 
the first one at the top of the list is, of course, Pygame. Um, Pygame's up there because I'm sure everyone in this room has heard of Pygame. Um, at its core, Pygame is one of the most stable SDL1 uh, simple direct media layer wrappers that we've got in Python. Uh, on top of that, it provides an absolutely amazing access aligned bounding box class, which is called Rect. Um, it also has sprites and groups and a couple of other things for putting your games together. Um, it's very opinionated, but it doesn't really enforce it very well. Um, definitely give it a spin if you haven't, because really it is the oldest thing we've got. Um, and it's actually the one that I learned most of my earliest stuff on. Uh, the second library I want to talk about is Piglet, which I've only used for like Hello World style things. Um, it's very, uh, this one actually runs on OpenGL, which is another graphics rendering library. Um, it's very simple um, and it has a slightly different selection of toolkits, but it's kind of like Pygame in that it's a bunch of individual pieces that you have to put together yourself. Um, from there, I'm going to move on to the Arcade library, which is built on top of uh, OpenGL and Piglet. Um, I've actually not used it. I've only started looking at it in the last couple of months. Um, but I've met Paul, who is the guy who writes it. Um, and I think there's a sprint today, but I don't remember. Um, so definitely check that one out. Uh, the last one up here is actually my library, um, PPB. Uh, it's called Pursuit Pi Bear. Uh, it's based on Pygame and SDL, so it's kind of the alternate option to arcade. <laughs> um, I'm a lot more opinionated in how you should put your game together. Uh, but it also gives you an engine to run your code um, and a lot of neat little features that just l make it much easier to write. Um, another thing to check out, I mentioned the ECS system. Um, Braga here was written by uh, Katie, Katie Silverio. Um, they originally built it to write a text-based adventure game, uh, which is actually n not at all all that different from what we were talking about here. It just changes where your render happens. Um, the bonus is that this is a really cool library to check out because they're doing some Python magic so you don't have to reach into the components to get your attributes. You can just ask the attribute on the object, the entity itself. Um, and the last plug is actually going to be a book. Uh, if you go to invent with python.com. Al Schwiegert's books are amazing. Um, he's got a couple of them on Pygame, one of which is the one that I actually learned to program on. Uh, so that's why you should definitely check that. Um, all right, so that's basically it. I'm sorry that went so fast. Um, if you've got any questions, you can find me. Twitter, PA Thunstrom. Uh, GitHub, PA Thunstrom. Email, PA Thunstrom at gmail.com. Uh, find me in the hall if you have questions, comments, anything you want. Um, I always love talking about games, and I will totally help you set something up. Um, and then if you want Pursued by Pair, github.com slash ppb is the actual organization that runs that. And you can start playing with it with pip install ppb.